So we're going to get started. Um, welcome everyone to the first ever Mass Makers virtual tour. I'm Diana Wagner. I'm a Masters of Industrial Design class of 2014 and one of the four leaders of the RISD Boston Alumni Club. Um, our uh, Boston Club co-leader Becky Fong, one of one of our co-leaders, um, couldn't join us this evening, but you might see her popping in and out. She's in an airport right now. Um, but I am joined by um, fellow club leaders Mindy Holm, illustration, and oh yes, the wave, please, <laughs> um, and Sarah Guerin, architecture, who will be the headliner for our tour this evening. So we'll get started with Sarah in just a minute. But a couple of announcements first. So, um, hello to everyone. I feel like we should all wave. Those of us who have video on. <laughs> hey. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so we want to thank you all for joining us tonight. So even though we're called the Boston Club, um, the four of us are trying to create experiences that take us to different parts of Massachusetts. So we're certainly noticing that we've got a lot of calls in today from the, the greater Boston area being the rest of the country. Um, so we're excited about the fact that we can we can join in, in this way virtually. Um, but just to say a little bit about the Boston Club in particular, we've been um, bowling in Somerville. We've shared beers across breweries around the area. We've toured the De Cordova Sculpture Park um, and hosted a Valentine's making event in Lower Newton Falls. Um, so for those of you who are, are um, far away from New England, that is quite a far expanse to um, our region, um, which we're, we're quite proud of here in the greater Boston area. Um, but we also have plans to reschedule our Founders Day event at the National Braille Press um, in Boston. And we hope to tour murals on the North Shore and offer an indigo dyeing workshop all this fall. So we have lots of other ideas and we hope that things go well um, and want to continue our virtual studio tours, which of course will remain open to, um, to any alumni. So um, we are wondering your thoughts about these events too. So if you have any ideas, um, we uh, please feel free to put them in the chat, but also we do want to get your impression um, from a couple of polls that we'll, we'll run this evening. So Mindy will be popping those up. Um, if you all are regular Zoom users, you'll be familiar with the poll feature. Um, it'll pop up on your screen. So if you could just quickly answer, um, that'll help us with some of our next steps in planning. So we have the first poll going out now. Um, if you all can answer that, um, it would be great. And, um, Wonderful. So while you all are going through the first poll, um, I do want to also encourage you to join the RISD Alumni Network. Um, so this is a this is connecting both um, alumni and students. So if you're interested in becoming a mentor or you're looking for guidance yourself, we'll pop the, the RISD Alumni Network link into the chat so that you can uh, directly connect to that. Um, we also want to remind you about the Alumni Association where lots of exciting news and uh, is available about alumni and you can also submit your own updates and stay in touch with fellow alumni all around the world. It's actually an incredibly cool website. If you all aren't familiar with it, I highly recommend you look at it because it was news to me fairly recently and becoming involved with this um, larger club in Boston and I really appreciate that website. So I would say that's a good one to take a look at <laughs> if you're not familiar. So we'll also put that into the chat. So um, all right, to get along with our um, programming tonight, um, uh, I, I want to, um, to, to say that as we're continuing with this social distancing, um, we thought that this platform would be a good way for us to showcase some of the Massachusetts alumni in lots of different disciplines um, and get the really cool opportunity to see people's studios or the amazing work that, that, that they're doing um, in different capacities um, around the area. So um, we do hope that this this catches on with other groups as well. It sounds like that that's something that will be popular. So um, we're excited to see what people are doing elsewhere outside of the greater Boston area too. Um, so, um, but just to say that <laughs> doing virtual stuff is very new to us. Um, while I think a lot of us are using Zoom for our work, I, I, that still technical issues are real. <laughs> so um, uh, we do wanna feature or uh, talk about a couple of the features in Zoom in particular. So you're welcome to use the chat tonight, um, which you've seen, you've uh, added in where you're calling in from. But um, if you'd ask, if you'd like to put any questions for um, Sarah in to the chat, um, we will um, take a look at them throughout, the, throughout our tour tonight. But um, we'll also try to save some time at the end if we don't get through everything. But the chat would be the, the best place for that. Also, we welcome any comments, oohs and ahs or things are great to put in the chat too, because um, we can all see that. But um, so uh, we do also want to recommend the speaker view. So that's the view. Um, if you click in the top right hand corner, there's a little icon that says speaker view. Um, 
in the right hand corner, uh, there's also gallery view. So if you use the, um, the speaker view, that'll sort of pop between um, who's speaking. So between Sarah and myself, or you can pin Sarah in particular, because you might just want to be seeing all the cool thing that she will, things that she will share with us. But if you do the gallery view, that'll show all the video screens and everybody who's on the call. So just so you know the difference between those features um, as we're going through the tour. But I think that's all of our sort of welcome um, addresses. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and uh, tonight, I'd like to introduce Sarah uh, live from her studio in Wakefield, Massachusetts. Sarah, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, Sarah graduated from RISD in 1999 with a Bachelor's of Architecture um, and is the owner and founder of Sabotoos, a bespoke boot making company where I may be a future apprentice for Sarah, fingers crossed. Um, so please join me in welcoming Sarah. You're all on mute. We can see you clapping. <laughs> so um, welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Diana. That was really lovely. Um, Welcome everybody to my little shop I call the 10 footer uh, because Massachusetts has this really long history of footwear production and I tie my practice into trying to recognize how the architecture of the time when shoes were made by hand supported the craft so that I can not look backwards but look forward and take those lessons learned and make a productive living tradition today um, and look towards the future. So my 10 footer is right behind me, you can see there. But at one time, there were little shops called 10 footers all over Massachusetts, several like 30, 40, sometimes 50 per town. And I and my husband built this replica 10 footer so that I could have my bespoke boot making practice in it. Um, there are two parts of my practice. Uh, I'm a bespoke boot maker, so I make boots for clients to their feet, their specific measurements, and I make them from raw materials by hand from scratch. I make the patterns and then I construct the boots myself. And then I also have an art practice where I make sculptural pieces that are can only be made with the skills and knowledge of the boot making tradition that I've acquired over the years. So we can go in the shop and I will talk about various aspects of boot making. Great, we can't wait to see inside. So Sarah, it'd be great to hear a bit about the space itself and some of your projects as we're, as we're walking through. Sure, so boot making has four distinct, um, distinct sections, let's say, to the overall part. There are more than 30, here I'll switch. There are more than 30 parts to making a pair of boots by hand, but it separates into four subsections. And uh, they're called pattern making and designing, clicking, which is cutting out leather by hand, and, uh, and the nice sound of the little knives clicking against old fashioned patterns that were edged in brass is what gave the name clicking. And that in itself is its own craft. There are people that only click for their entire lives. And uh, closing, which is sewing all the pieces of the upper part of a boot together, and then making. So boot making or shoe making is all the processes where most of the work is done of turning these pieces of leather into a piece of footwear. So I have my shop separated by discipline. And this is the making, right? When you walk in the front door, I call it my cockpit. And this is the area of making. So you can see I have all my hand tools, my irons. And most of these irons are from the late 1800s and early 1900s from France and a few from Germany. Um, I didn't mention, but I am both French and American. So I have the benefit of having both cultures and easy access to things in France. And this is where I work on uh, the making part. So this is um, a pair of enormous size, men's size 22 boots that I'm working on right now as part of an art project. Uh, but I also have several pairs at various stages. And I can talk a little bit about the, the different construction types. But this is like the, the messiest part of my, of my um, practice. So this is the messy side of the shop. And I both sit and stand, um, that's my inseaming stand, in this section and have on three sides of me, I have all my hand tools. To the back of me, I have my line finisher 
which uh, as far as electric tools go, I have three. I have two sewing machines and this line finisher. So it's really like a big sanding machine and it's got a few circular cutting tools. I bought this one from a cobbler. It's one of the few tools that cobblers have in common with shoemakers. And cobblers are really people who are trained to fix shoes, which is its own craft. And so that's why mine has brushes and polishers, but I don't, I don't use those. I do all that work by hand. And I also have my crimping machine, which is this wonderful mechanical old machine from Texas that uh, there are only a few left in the United States, and I happen to be lucky enough to get one. And this is um, a machine that takes a 2D piece. This is a pattern piece in, in paper, but I would cut out a piece of leather for the vamp that covers the forepart of the foot with this. And when you crimp it down, it turns that into a 3D piece. Here's, here's the hand version of this. This one I did by hand by stretching and nailing. Wow, it's incredible so to see the tool for that and next to what you did by hand. So I have, I have a station here, which is kind of, I have all the different boots that I have made lined up, but this is where I would measure clients. So if you were to have me make boots for you, you would come and sit in this chair and I would measure your feet and take imprints and, and um, do various things in order to get all the information I needed to make boots that fit your feet. And I have a design corner, which is my actual old drafting table from RISD that I still use. And I have my making corner, my two sewing machines that are um, industrial sewing machines for leather. And I use each one for a different practice. Uh, and then I have a big work table in the center, which is where I do most of my work standing. I'm really tall, so I like to stand when I work because shoemaking involves a lot of hunched over. And then I have newly added to the shop um, a last making station, which uh, is I can easily bring outside and it's really lovely. I live on an old mill river that used to feed the, the mill factory at the end of our street. And I can be outside here and work on last. And lasts are where all footwear making starts because uh, lasts also is its own craft, um, is the, the negative, a representation of the negative space of a boot or a shoe that comes from all the knowledge of the feet that you measured, but it also has this really intricate skill of understanding how the foot structure of bone is covered by different thicknesses of muscle and fat and how to appropriately make footwear that, um, you know, won't hurt your feet, ideally. Wow, so Sarah, you talked about um, designing the studio itself after sort of an architectural reference to the 10-footer, and you talked a little bit about the, um, the, the last being sort of the armature for the shoe and then the leather being the skin. We're curious how that relates to your foundation in architecture at RISD and how that sort of is tied into your experience um, and your current practice in boot making. Sure, you know, as far as, as um, process goes, boot making is really a, just a smaller scale of architecture. I don't see having done, started in an architectural education, worked a little bit in architecture and then did many things on my way to becoming a boot maker. It's, the process is very similar. And I, in retrospect, the scale of architecture was too big for me personally, although I didn't recognize that that was why I kept moving away from it. But the, the processes I loved, and those were all the same. You still design, you still make really intricate patterns, whether it's by hand or with a computer, they are super precise. And I love the precision of doing that. And you then you have this construction phase and you have a material exploration phase and all the things about that exist in the process of architecture still exist in boot making at a much smaller scale. So I don't find them to be that different in my experience of, of both. And yeah. I can, you know, argue that architecture is, is designing space and experience in the same way. But I also feel like when you are specifically footwear, something that you wear that affects your life so, so, Immediately, like if you're walking through a cobblestone square in stilettos, your experience is going to be very different from walking through that same space with flat shoe 
shoes on. And if they hurt and pinch your feet in the joint, it's going to be another, you're still designing experiences actually in a, in a theoretical way, in the same way of architecture. It's like a personal wearable experience. So can you show us some of your examples of boots that are already fully constructed after seeing sort of the different stages that you walked through? Um, can we sure. see some? Sure. This is, this is a Rober style boot. So what I really like about West, I came to Western Boots by them finding me. This is not something that I aimed to do, but along my path, I ended up making Western Boots, which is a side themed boot that um, is based on the construction of American Civil War cavalry boots that evolved into this, this design. And it's uh, very uniquely American. It's one of the like latest footwear developments. I mean, sneakers and things, Things. Yes, of course, but this this boot evolved to a certain point, and it, it's this perfect marriage of function. Sorry, there's an airplane. <laughs> it's this perfect marriage of function and design. And what I like about it is that all the pieces come from an origin of function. They still work that way, and it's almost like a blank canvas every time with the same base and the base changes to the person's measurements, but the fundamental structure of the base doesn't change. So I really enjoy basing them. So this is a roper because it has like a men's dress heel. It's a, it has a low one inch to half inch heel. It doesn't have that classic, the classic cowboy boot shape that you think of with an undercut heel, a higher, probably like a closer to one and three quarter inch to and, and the curved instep shape profile. Uh, so these are two finished boots that I've done, but they're all made of four upper pieces, a vamp, the counter, and then a front and a back top that are seamed on the side. You make them inside out, almost like you're making a dress, but it's fat, like sewing fabric. And then you turn it right side out and attach it to the, the bottoming. And that's how you construct the boot. They're beautiful on their own. And you talked about your practice being both functional and um, artistic in terms of the sculptural um, aspects of, of your work, um, sort of more of the art side of what you do. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of how you consider your work, you know, sculpture or apparel, apparel or both? Like, where do you see those, those parallels or, or sort of those differences? So to, to become a boot maker takes a really, really long time. And this was difficult education to to acquire and I went to a shoemaking school after RISD in England and then I trained with a, a western bootmaker for three years and when I started I still after having done this for several years was a beginner and it takes years and years and years of practice and and learning more and perfecting and seeking out information to to, to do this craft just to make boots like to make a plain pair of boots that might fit someone you know, with your best intent, but they, they still may not fit quite right. So I have spent many years now working on, on my craft. And in the past, I want to say like three years, and then I always have made like little sculptural pieces. I'm a maker. I make all the time and along the way. But in the past few years, I've really gotten good enough at boot making that I could start making pieces that were art pieces. And I don't, I make them like in between orders or at night when it's just something I feel like I have to do. And I, I, um, I might have an impetus like these razor blade boots that I've made came because- Can you see they, them? Yes, so the, their story behind those was they were a long time in the making, but I was never good enough at the skills of boot making to really make the piece that I wanted to make. And when I finally got there, I was able to complete them and finish them and they were going to be in an exhibit. So that was like a good, uh, you know, catalyst to get me moving and finish them. And then recently I've just been doing more of that, like I, interspersing my client work with my, my art pieces. So, so sure. you had like a vision for the razor blade boots and acquired the skills in order to fulfill them in the way that you saw them in yeah. your mind's eye. Yeah. Exactly. So these are, are boots made to my feet that are executed in all the ways that, that fine bespoke footwear is made, except they're covered with 2200 exacto blades. So you actually could never wear them because you would get hurt. <laughs> or others <laughs> nearby. <laughs> but they're, 
they were they were they were an important piece to me because not only the the finished piece, which is you know I attention grabbing, but the process of working like was very deliberate. The process of sewing right. each razor blade with with utmost attention and focus, so as not to cut myself, was the point of of making them. Right. Well, you talked about um, sort of how how acquiring your craft sort of required additional education and a lot of practice and a lot of work. Was there a breakthrough moment in that experience or in that that process that got you to where you are today? Well, there were a few. Um, it wasn't it, making shoes or making boots wasn't something that I knew was a possibility. It's something that I could do. That this is a profession one has. I didn't know anybody who did it. We don't really have any strong found like a institutional foundation in the United States or system that supports this kind of craft. And it was just something I didn't know. So I, I loved shoes and I loved boots and I loved making things, but those, it wasn't like this clear idea. And even if I thought about, okay, this is what I want to do. I didn't know how to do it. And a friend of mine sent me a, literally a ripped out page from a Vogue magazine article about Cordwainers college at the, in London that had been around in some form since the 1200s and the London College of Fashion had t taken it over in the early 2000s. And so Vogue did the spread on how Jimmy Choo went to the school and learned how to make shoes by hand. And it was the first time that I, I like saw a path towards doing like, yes, I have to go to this place. I have to learn these things. And it took me several years to get there, but I'm a very determined person and getting the things that I want. So it was just like, that's my goal. That's where I'm going. And, and I went, I, I eventually went there. So that was a huge breakthrough moment. I thought naively that you go to a school like that and when you graduate, then you're a shoemaker, then you can do what you wanna do. Not knowing that this craft takes so much time to learn. And when I went to leave, the professors said, basically, if you really wanna take the direction, not of being a designer, but of being a maker, you need to find somebody to apprentice with. And then that was this long, difficult process of finding finding someone that did it first because I already had children at this point I wasn't mobile and I couldn't take off to find somebody anywhere in the country or in the world but also when I finally found somebody in Massachusetts he didn't want to take me on so it took a while of just beating him down and beating him down and and begging him until I, he finally said yes and he took me on for three years and was just incredibly incredibly generous so that was a huge breakthrough moment too, when he said yes, and that's that's when it became real. That's incredible. It's so boot making or shoe making. You know, all of this is is very much a living history. Like it 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 has to be passed down. It has to sort of have this. It has this tradition in it, and it sort of is evolving with its next generations. I, I know in your work you do a lot of um, research about the history of boot making and shoe making in Massachusetts. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that history of being from this area influences your work? Yeah, that, that actually came later. I, I think of that as part of my practice. I think of my, my studio and my practice in three parts, the, the shoe making for people, I mean the boot making for people, the art pieces, and then the tying in architectural space and history. And it informs my work and how I see it. And it's this ongoing forever lifelong search of knowledge and then putting the pieces together and understanding how it all works. and. Um, I did not know about the Massachusetts history. I grew up in Lynn, Massachusetts, and Swampscott, the next town over, which was the center of shoemaking in the entire world for many, many, many years, and didn't know that because it's completely gone. And you know, it's a it's a sad city that industry left and has that feeling. Although it's becoming more vibrant and it has its wonderful history, I don't mean to put Lynn down, but. I didn't, I grew up there and didn't know. And I've, I've, over the last few years, as I research and research and get so excited and tie these stories in and tie the, the practices and, you know, why things worked well and why, why things fell apart in the footwear production, um, I've, I'm quickly becoming the one who knows most about it around here. And, and I share it, all this knowledge that I possibly can and get feedback, our, our footwear making community spread out all over the world is pretty tight through the internet now, which is great. And, you know, if I share a piece of information, I get something back from how things were made in Hungary. And it just, it's like pieces of a, a wonderful puzzle coming together. That's, that's an yeah. exciting way to live. So those of us who follow you online know that you're working on a miniature um, boot project. 
And we would love to see that process or some of the steps that you're working on in that, um, just to see the difference in the scale. If you want to talk or show us a little bit about that miniature. Sure, um, I'd love to. Uh, I, I do think about changes in scale often, both back from my RISD education when I was in architecture to you know, the history, whether it's like small scale manufacturing to large scale manufacturing, I, I like playing with scale and always have. And um, one of the art pieces that I started um, a few weeks ago, I guess, was a perfect 44% scale of a cowboy boot. So I have the full, this was the last, it was made in Mexico that I used as a model. Oh and I it's gigantic things. in comparison. <laughs> it's, this is a men's size pen. Wow. And this is the perfect reproduction of 44% of this lab. So I've been, you know, I, you, as a maker, you learn things when you have to change scale. So it's like part of it's exciting and it's cute and it just makes me think about the process as I'm working. Boot making, there's a lot of time alone just working and working with your hands and thinking. And it's also a challenge to scale and sort of see it and realize it with the same technique, but in such a different scale. Yeah, yeah. And, and things like the scale of, of stitches and the scale of the thickness of the materials, like each material had to shrink down to, to the appropriate scale. And uh, along my journey to getting to boot making, I worked in a model building shop in Paris for a few years and was a professional model builder. And, so there, I, a lot of the things that I would think about as I'm building these, you know, massive models of, of trains for industrial designers and thinking about like what they're thinking when you're working at this scale of something that's going to be much larger scale is kind of going through my head, but it's going to be this tiny boot. So I have a lot of the pieces done, but, um, and I work on it a little at a time and, and it seems to be very popular. It's cute things are popular. They are, but, but also... I also... When you started, you were, um, when we walked, when we entered your studio to see the space where you do um, the boot making portion, um, you are working on a very large boot. Do you want to talk about the sort of comparison of working on something really tiny to working on something extremely large <laughs> relative yes. to the tiny? <laughs> so this, this project was pretty exciting for me because, um, but where is this, is this kind of funny craft that straddles several disciplines. It's, it's part of its apparel, part of its it kind of an industrial design discipline, part of it's just pure craft, traditional art craft, and, and part of it can be art. You know, there's, there's a rich history of art in footwear, and it's hard to get recognition for that in order to support my practice. So I'm constantly applying for grants as an artist and often just get back like, we don't quite understand because you're, you're making boots, so like it's not really art. And um, recently, just last week, I was awarded a, a grant, an art making grant that's a collaborative project. So I got paired with a muralist and we, you know, immediately started working on our project together. So I said, I will make the largest possible boot I can make for him to do his work on since we're working together. And I, and I have a size, men's size 22 last that I had bought off eBay that was made for a man who worked for a circus in Florida and had had boots made on them. So again, in, in comparison to size, here's a, here's a woman size eight, and here's the men size 22. It's this massive scale change. So, so it's a little ironic that I'm working on the miniature boot as well as this massive boot, which needs the same kind of considerations. You know, leathers that hold themselves up and are, are self-structural aren't when you're working at this scale. So they need to be reinforced in certain ways. and, and it's exciting. It, I, I find it exciting. I, I think it sounds incredible and, um, and very cool and very inspiring. Um, and I, I think, I think it'd be great to ask some of the questions that are coming through from the chat. Um, so I want to, um, to sort of peer towards those, um, it, people are asking um, about a sort of how you build a clientele for this and um, and uh, how how you how you work with clients and um, and how frequently because it sounds like your your practice is quite robust you do various things um, in order to, to to support it so if you want to talk a little bit about sort of interacting with clients and, and what that looks like in your practice sure it, it's difficult to find clients I, a lot I charge literally charge $35 an hour which is the lowest rate for boot makers 
and it's a pair of boots in the simplest possible form without any kind of decorative work would still be three thousand five hundred dollars so there's it's hard to find the right people but but i do you know slowly mostly word of mouth and instagram and there's also this very strong tradition in western boots and in cowboy boots that have set decorative designs and i don't make boots like that so i'm definitely this niche person who designs the the patterns of my boots to reflect the character of my client in a way that's that it would be a good marriage with certain people, but not with other people. So if certain people who love cowboy boots come to me and they want, you know, the classic Rotterman stitch, I, I would say that's, that's not something that that's my strength and not something I do, but go to this bootmaker, this person's better for you. And, you know, hopefully some of the bootmakers, I know somebody says, I want something completely unique and, you know, uh, different than anything I've ever seen. Then I'm, I'm the person to come to for that because my, my decorative design is really based on my the fundamentals that I learned at RISD that you're whether it was in freshman foundation or in architecture where you're designing specifically with information and developing the designs based on like a collaborative process or based on some design impetus that that makes sense and and is a kind of a linear process and a story and that's how I do my design so I'm very uh, like I said, I'd be a good marriage for certain people and, and just word of mouth. So sometimes I, I don't have an order, for, to be honest, and that's when I have more time to do, you know, the artwork and I'm applying for grants and doing the best I can. But they keep every time I think that, you know, this won't be sustainable, then orders come in and, right. and it keeps going. It's, part of <laughs> it's the really process. a of dedication that I don't want to leave. So I just keep hope that yeah. the more that the gets, and I'm becoming more well known I, and the more that happens the the easier it is for people to know who i am and what my work is like and feel comfortable in investing in in that kind of both peace and in a practice without worrying you know am i throwing away four thousand dollars because <laughs> who knows what i'm gonna get <laughs> it sounds like you're open to aspects of collaboration um in taking on clients and sort of building building an idea that will both use your skill in sort of this detail oriented um, design um, work and sort of what a client wants. Can you show us an example of, of something that um, that sort of marries those two, the idea of collaboration and your skill set? Yes, I will show you two different pair of boots and just my quick design process on them. So this, this pair of boots is, is more traditional in cowboy boot world. So the so woman was having her initials, which is very common, an initial inlay. And here's the boots, but uh, wanted wisteria plants. So instead of putting, often in, in Western boot world, you have a plant and it's in a very direct representational of what the plant looks like or, or some kind of simplified interpretation of it. But for her, I took shadows off of the screen of wisteria leaves and made photocopies and played around with the scale and eventually until I came up with a pattern that reflects wisteria, but not necessarily, you know, one-to-one -one correlation. So this kind of inlay, or this one, the leaves are overlay, was something different. Yet you have this kind of traditional idea of of inlay initials. And I looked up. Um, this one was fun because I don't know if you could see. I looked yeah. up old. Oh wow! We can start to see the texture. And I do a lot of embroidery by hand, like little elements on my pieces. So it's it's slightly different than what you would get from most Western bootmakers who have a very like well established history of how to work. Another one, this one is my personal favorite. The man um, whose boots these are sent me this picture and said, "I want that on my boots." And you know, I had like two days of holy crap, how am I going to do that on a pair of boots? <laughs> He's, a, he's an antique stove refurbisher, and this was a cast iron stove back called the Fire Fiend from the 1800s. So I played around with a few things. At first I thought, like in cowboy boots, you know, you, there's lots of stitching. So I would do the hair with stitching, and it just wasn't working the way I wanted. So I went, like, literally into RISD mode, where, like, how can I do this differently? And looked into, you know, the, the guy who designed this was a tile ceramic artist. So he probably made it in clay first and then cast it and, and you know made a mold so I started with that and I made I had I literally had leftover casting wax from when I took a bronze casting course at RISD 
<laughs> and made, made a few of these little, little, you know, representations of the faces and made a mold and researched um, how to do these old Roman techniques where you put leather in boiling water and then put it in the presses. Yeah. And so this is one of the rejects. I made several of them. And then, and then this was the last reject. So the two on his boot are the best ones I did, but that was the last reject and is on this sample boot I made. And he was just super happy with them. And then the, the design of the boot itself was modeled after a parlor stove and the elements on that parlor stove, like interpreted into um, kind of traditional Western boot stitching. And so that my, my RISD experience really informed how I did this boot. And I brought this boot to a, a Western boot making um, convention and you know, everybody there was just like, I, I have no idea how you did do that. Cause it's not, it's not tooled the way leather's tooled. And I, I have no great skill in leather tooling. It's not something that I've devoted time to, yeah. but I have this other, you know, assets in design that, that are different because I come from a different path and I'm really grateful to Rizzi for that. The detail work is so fine, Sarah. Like it's incredible. I think there, hopefully there's people in the audience that are, are familiar with, with leather. And even if you're not like this level of work in detail and um, fine work in leather is incredible, especially outside the process that Sarah described in sort of a traditional carving. Like it's so cool to see. And I'm wondering, you described sort of the process and um, the different techniques. Is there a favorite tool that you have in, in sort of um, executing this work, whether it's a hand tool or, or even um, sort of a mechanical tool that um, that you love the most to help with your work? My hands are my favorite tools. I know, <laughs> I know it's, the, yeah. it's the, like, the cheating response because, uh, but it's, this is something that, that I thought a lot of when I was at RISD because we were just so much design, design, design. And I would, you know, how, how, I'd go all the time to my friend in ceramics who was actually learning to work with his hands more, or I took the hands-on courses at winter session that I could. But there's, there's something that my hands can do that only if you have spent the last, 15 years doing what I do with them. Can you do it? Like you couldn't decide right now, I want to make shoes and be able to do the things that I can do. And, and it's this, it's, it's thrilling. It's thrilling. I love my hands and I have to take care of them in a way that is like a tool. I, I have to make sure that I sleep with my fingers flat. So I, I lay them in a certain way and I, you know, ice them when I, I deliberately choose which processes I'm going to do because some are really hard on my hands. So that's my favorite tool. To be honest, they are but, your tool. <laughs> but I will show you my favorite actual tool. Other tool, not actual tool, other tool. <laughs> Which I don't get to use that often. So it's not like it's a lot of bootmakers get asked this question and it's usually a knife. Like your knife becomes an extension of your hand and it has to be super honed and, you know, but to me it's this hammer because it's, it's a beautiful object and I love, I love beautiful objects and it's totally functional and it's really unique and odd. And this, the shape of this curve is specifically made to hammer in the, the curve of a shank so that when you're hammering the leather, the edges of the, the hammer don't leave a little indent because it's wet in case. Wow. And the other side is perfectly flat. You know, most hammers have a little bit of a curve to them because that's for hammering the fore four part, which needs to be perfectly flat without any indents. And you just use it at this one point in this really long, laborious process. But without this hammer, my, the work wouldn't be as fine and wouldn't, it wouldn't be as smooth and look as well. And I just, I'm so excited when I get to that point in boot making, when I get to use this hammer and the weight of it. And the, I found it at the Brimfield Antique Fair. In oh, yeah. <laughs> but the weight of it and this particular handle it's one of those things with hammers that you don't know until you hold it in your hand that it was made for your hands and this one was. That's incredible. Well, so talking about the tools and sort of seeing how much that you appreciate the way that that works so specifically for the material and for the process that you're doing. Um, what I feel I, I want to know and, and we've gotten a question in the chat um, about the, the specifics of the materials you use and I, it, I mean, we understand sort of the leather, but maybe not the specifics to them or the differences in the leather and, um, and the way that you might select um, different materials or sort of where you select them or how you select them, sort of any aspect of the materials that you use that you want to talk about. I think we'd be curious to hear. Sure. Well, 
Well, there, there are two types of leather that you use in, in boot making. You use veg tan leather. So it's this leather that's tanned um, in a pit, usually, you know, with bark and leaves and water. And it's really long. It needs to be left in there for, you know, nine months to a year and a half. And, and you have various qualities of this kind of leather. But it, it has certain characteristics. It's what I made the tiles out of. But the soles and the heels are made of different le um, lifts, they're called, the pieces that get built one at a time. And the insole, the foundational piece, are all made with veg tan. And I use um, two tanneries, leather from two tanneries, one J.R. Rendenbach in Germany and the other is the Baker Tannery in England because they're, they have long traditions, they have good practices as far as best environmental impact from what I can tell so far. You know, you can trace and talk to them, it's families that work there and, um, and just really high quality leather. So that's what I use, um, those two. And then upper leather is called chrome tan or aniline leather is more like fabric. It has drape to it, it's tanned with chemicals and um, there are some veg tans now that you can use for the top, but it's relatively new in production wise um, because there's a demand for it. Some countries are, are starting to, I mean, some companies are starting to offer it, but it has, I, I use a lot from Horween, which is a tannery in Chicago that I visited because the same thing I, I can, Horween will track down to the farmer where the cows were in Canada and the U S and I also use a lot of French calf from the Anone and um, the Pou tanneries in the south of France, France, which are small tanneries and have a long-standing history that you can look back to. And I like supporting those businesses and I like their products. And I try, I will do better over time, but as I get to know more places, but I try to support um, family businesses if I can. Yeah, well, beautiful materials certainly make beautiful products, which we've definitely seen in your work. Um, so how you described how many hours it takes to produce a pair of boots. So um, about how many can you produce in a year? Or do you, do you want to tell us <laughs> how many hours you work? <laughs> oh, more and more. I'll say more and more. I have, I have three children that I take care of all the time. So I, it had started out with you know, maybe 15 hours a week if I were lucky. So I was only producing maybe three pair a year then. And my youngest is 12 now. So I have a lot more time and freedom. And I've maybe like six, I'd say now I could do in a year. But, um, but for example, I, I'll show, I have a picture of these boots. I don't have the actual boot. But these boots I did at the end of last year, I finished them in August, if you can see them. Yeah. There was so much hand embroidery on these boots. I thought they would take sooner and my, my client had a budget and then she had a very strong idea of what she wanted. And when I kept trying to tell her that that was way more work than the budget, she just was like, that's what I want, that's what I want. And she was willing to pay for it. So I spent a much longer time <laughs> on those boots than usual. So I made fewer boots that year but she, she paid for the time that went into doing all that hand embroidery and it was 280 hours on those boots. So. Oh my God. <laughs> You're a masterwork. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I was quite happy. I'm not trying, my end goal isn't to yeah. high production, to make right. beautiful, unique pieces that bring people joy. Right. So in the context of your work, sort of what keeps, I mean, it sounds like that's kind of a beautiful moment where the, the, um, the marriage between sort of what somebody might be asking for and you being able to execute the skills that you've developed and a practice that you really enjoy, like the embroidery or the hand embroidery. Is there, what, is there an aspect of your work that, um, that keeps you up at night or is, that you're most curious about exploring further or wanting to explore on sort of with the opportunity of collaborating with clients and things? I don't know. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I can't think of anything specific. Every pair of boots I make, yeah, I'm, I'm improving on some, you know, there's some new problem or, you know, the leather didn't cut in the right way or this or that. So I'm always improving on, on technique, like physical te technique of construction and, and fit. I, I suppose fit is where I would really like to improve. And the collaboration part of that is trying to deduce from a person what their idea of good fit is. It's yeah. like I was an architect designing a building for somebody, a house, and I could tell much more about them from 
the space they lived in already or their clothes or the things they talked about than I could from what they said they wanted. And, that, and that's difficult with footwear that you have to try to figure out what someone else thinks is good fit. Somebody might like it really tight. Somebody might like it loose. It might not be that, that straightforward, you know, it's, it, and you take all this information from them and then work on the design, the, the look, the aesthetics of it, which is exciting too, but really like to fit to someone else's idea of fit is, and the feet in front of you is the biggest challenge and exciting part. Yeah, we got a question in the chat about, did you study feet? And it sounds like every person is unique. We, we know that about, <laughs> about feet. They're all different. Um, but did you have to study anything in particular? Or, is, or do you have to sort of keep in mind specific rules every time you're introduced to a new person and the way that you want to fit them? There's some general things. When at the shoemaking school, um, we did study you know, basic feet stuff. And feet are very, very complicated. So there are certain things that you keep in mind when you're, you're looking at a foot, like this bone here and this bone here are critical to of where they land inside the shoe and how much flesh is around them. And then this is really where the elastic parts of the transverse arch are, is where you can really grab a foot. So a, a cowboy boot in particular has to be precise because it's a pull-on boot. It has to be able to slide on easily, but then grab your foot at the same time um, without having your heel lift when you walk. It's not like a clog where your foot comes up. So I did, you know, study basics of feet at the shoemaking school. I, I make every effort I can to get together with other footwear makers um, at like footwear symposiums or groups. And we've had different uh, foot surgeons talk to us about, about feet or how feet get deformed from wearing heels over time and that kind of stuff. But there's so much more I could know that I haven't learned yet. I, I know um, Daphne Board, who is a shoemaker who is the same year as I am, was at RISD, is, is a shoemaker in Western Mass now, and she's a certified podorthist. So she spent a lot of time learning from orthopedic footwear makers about, about feet. She knows far more about feet than I do. And you can definitely go down that rabbit hole of, of learning more about feet, especially people who have feet that aren't easily fit in mass-produced shoes. Um, well, Sarah, we're about ready to wrap up, but I want to ask, um, sort of before you go, um, or before we sort of wrap up, we have a couple of questions that we want to ask, um, our participants tonight, and if any more questions come through the chat, but before we do, um, what, um, who inspires you the most, um, other, another artist or maker? The, <laughs> a good friend of mine now, but the artist, uh, Fawn, who is with Studio Habeas Corpus, who used to be in the Boston area, but she's now in, New Orleans inspires me more than anybody. And you check out her Instagram and look at her work. She really has this large scale worldwide manifesto of, of materials and their impact on the world and on every scale and artisanry and just so many good things. And she's, she's, she's the, the one right now. <laughs> Oh, that's great to hear. And it was really incredible to see your studio and to see your process and to see your tools and, and materials and um, examples of your work. I personally feel extremely inspired, inspired and I'm sure that um, the audience says it well as well. So um, if anybody is looking for custom boots, please talk to Sarah or we put um, contact information for Sarah in the chat um, and you can follow her on, on Instagram. Um, but if anybody has some last questions that want to come in, we will do a final farewell. But before we do, um, we have a couple of poll questions that we want to send out. Um, so again, feel free to add some, some, any questions in the chat to wrap up, but um, Mindy will send out um, can I last poll question. Yes, please. Can I say who at RISD had the most impact? <laughs> oh, please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I had it. Several teachers that really impacted me in different ways, but hands down, the architecture professor Jim Barnes had more impact on my life than maybe like anybody I've ever met ever. And in funny ways, because I never had him as a critic, um, I had him in materials and methods class and and structures and you know all talk to him all the time. But he always always encouraged me to make footwear even when I was at RISD and it wasn't like like I said it wasn't a thing that I knew one could do and he was just like that's what you like doing you should do it and he was just so encouraging and like started opening that seed and then 
two years after I left RISD, he was doing his winter session in Paris course. And I lived in Paris at the time and I was so depressed and unhappy. And he took me out to dinner and he was like, if you could do anything right now, what it would it be? And I said, I'd be making shoes. And he's like, then do it. Go make shoes. Go home to your apartment, make shoes, find out how to do it, put them online. And like, I literally went home and was like, okay, how can I do this? And that, that was a real important moment too. And he also told all the architecture students junior year, my junior year, you should go out and get a construction job this summer because every one of you is going to try to work for an architect and you'll be better architects if you do construction. So I ran out because I'm a good student and I got a construction job. And by the end of that summer, I was like, I am never not working with my hands. This is, <laughs> I'm not going to be an architect that, that, that sits at a, at a table or at a computer. And, and I also, the carpenter that I worked for that summer is now my husband, Jim Barnes. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, so um, do you have any advice for anybody who might want to pursue this line of work? Uh, it's not easy. It's, um, it's difficult because there's no clear path to do it. But if you have the passion for it and you're ready to spend the rest of your life, years and years and years and years, learning this craft and improving on it, then there are ways to do it. Find the way. Um, money is not the end game. You're not going to get rich doing this. Even the people that kind of use more machines and can produce more still struggle a lot with money. It's a common theme between all of us. And um, But I wouldn't change it for anything. I, I am the most successful person I know because I get to do what I love every single day. So. Well, that's incredible. So we'll send out one more poll question to, to our audience. Um, and um, we'll ask, uh, we got a question in the chat, if, um, if you, have you ever had um, a boot making mentor? So is there somebody that you learned from that um, maybe it was your experience apprenticing with somebody else, or maybe it was another person who was a mentor to you in this particular process, um, sort of outside what you shared in terms of a professor who um, influenced you? Sure, Cer certainly the boot maker that trained me in Massachusetts for three years for free uh, for hours and hours and hours was, you know, had a huge impact on me. He's a very private person. And like I said, it took me a long time to convince him to take me on. So I don't, I don't talk about him often because I respect his privacy, but he absolutely is the one that, that transferred this incredible amount of knowledge to me. But there's also another bootmaker in Austin, Texas, who I, whom I have never met in person named Lee Miller, who's generally regarded as the best bootmaker in the world. And he is so open with his, with his knowledge and his help that he's, he's become somebody that like every one of us who's in the bootmaking community can text or email and say, how do you fix this? How do you do that? Like, what's the, and he answers right away. He's just so generous with his knowledge and I'm, I'm grateful for it. Well, we in turn are incredibly grateful for you sharing your knowledge with us and welcoming us into your studio and showing us your work. It was really wonderful to see and I had an incredible time and I visited in person, which other people have asked if they can visit in person. So hopefully you'll get in touch with Sarah and see if she'll be willing to host yeah. you um, for a tour. Um, yes, please do get in touch. And um, and we hope that you all had a good, good time tonight. If anyone is interested in, um, in um, hosting uh, a tour of your studio with us or know an alumni who would be interested, please um, reach out to us. So um, Mindy has put in the chat um, contact information for all of us in the Boston Club. Um, and um, we would love to, to continue our series as our inaugural event with Sarah of um, Math Makers. Um, and so we hope to bring more details about another event soon, which we don't have lined up yet, but hope to hear from you if you have anyone in mind. But we do expect to continue it um, throughout the year, um, but we're just not certain about this season yet. But um, I, I want to thank you again, Sarah. This was really incredible and uh, really fun to see. So um, if everyone wants to, to give a, a, a round of applause to Sarah, even if it's on mute, thank you so much for joining us in your studio and thank you for joining tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Great interview, Diana. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Mindy. Oh, I didn't do anything. <laughs> Great. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, we want to want to want to wrap up on time, but um, I think we uh, we co co 
club leads might stay here and chat a minute. Yeah. So <laughs> but if Trey wants to take off recording, we'll um we'll say farewell to everyone um for tonight. Thank you. Bye. Good night.